this is Snoqualmie Pass, easily the most heavily traveled mountain pass in all the Pacific Northwest. I-90 crosses the Cascades Range here. Let's take a little trip from North Bend up and over Snoqualmie Pass to learn old stories from the bedrock, the landforms, and even days of early human travel up and over the range. Remember from our last episode of I-90 Rocks, heading east out of North Bend means climbing Grouse Ridge, a complex of glacial till, glacial outwash, and glacial erratics from the Puget Lobe, the thick ice sheet from Canada that covered Seattle. But I-90 East here uses a valley sculpted by glacial ice that flowed down from the mountains, alpine ice, not an ice sheet. The freeway goes up the South Fork of the Snoqualmie River and then down the Yakima River on the other side of the pass. Both valleys were under alpine ice many times during the Ice Age. But in the North Bend area, the mountain glacier was already melting back into the mountains when the Puget Lobe, the ice sheet from Canada, arrived for the last time 16,900 years ago. As you drive the 30 miles from North Bend to Snoqualmie Pass, alpine glacial deposits are mostly concealed by a dense forest cover. But in the high country, glacial erosional features abound. McClellan Butte, a glacial horn was shaved by ice. And Huckleberry Mountain. And Chickaman Peak. Their beauty is a direct result of glacial erosion. And U-shaped valleys, a classic signature of alpine ice, are on display. But something's missing up here at the pass. Where are the cirques? So this is the usual scene in a mountain range with alpine glaciers. Ice flowing in both directions away from the crest of the mountains. Ice is carrying rocks, plucking rocks away from the bedrock. And as the glaciers continue to erode, they leave steep walls. So when the ice melts back, we have a cirque on one side and a cirque on the other. Big bowl-shaped cuts that the glaciers eroded away from the bedrock. Two steep walls on the backs of both cirques is the usual scene. So to build a road up and over the pass, usually you have to get up and over these back-to-back -back cirque walls. Snoqualmie Pass is different. Snoqualmie Pass is lower because more than a thousand feet of glacial ice crossed the divide in this part of the Cascade Range. There's no steep wall. There's no big cirque. Right at the divide, right at Snoqualmie Pass, a thousand feet of ice crossing from west to east. Here's the map that will help us. Two glaciers flowed toward the pass from the north. Glaciers formed in the valleys of what is now Source Lake and Commonwealth Creek. The glaciers merged at the base of Guy Peak. The now bigger glacier flowed down to Snoqualmie Pass and then right at the ski area, the ice split again. One tongue of ice dropped to the west, down to North Bend. The other ice tongue flowed right over Traveler's Rest at the pass and headed down the Yakima River Valley to the east. The ice disobeyed the drainage divide and did its own thing. Impressive. All of that ice is gone now. The Yakima River today takes the scenic route to the Pacific Ocean, east to Ellensburg, south to Pasco, and then finally west through the Columbia River Gorge to Portland, and then on to the ocean. But the Cascades have a much longer history than the Ice Age. World-famous, cone-shaped volcanoes, fueled by ocean floor subduction, has been steady here for tens of millions of years. But Mount Rainier is only half a million years old, and Mount St. Helens, much younger than that. State of Washington, Cascade Range. It's a volcanic mountain range with 40 million years of history of volcanic eruptions. These are the five cones we have today. Mount Baker, Glacier Peak, Mount Rainier, Mount St. Helens, Mount Adams, and here's Snoqualmie Pass and I-90 cutting right through that scene. 
There's a 40 million year history, but each of these cones have been standing for less than 2 million years. Cones have a 2 million year lifespan. So if we go back over the last 40 million years, there are other locations where cones used to stand. They've been carefully mapped out. Dozens of old places where cones used to stand, they've been eroded away completely, and these five are the ones we have to enjoy during our time on the planet. So I-90 travelers cross through the Cascades without ever seeing a volcano. But looking for coarse-grained granite has its advantages. So how do we know where these cones used to stand? If they're completely gone, how do we know where they used to be? The answer is the magma chamber. Magma chambers feed active cones. It's the plumbing supply. The magma is feeding the volcanic eruptions. But if we remove the heat, the magma turns to stone, and when we erode the cone, the magma chamber rock is right at the surface, often accompanied with uplifts. You can have a mountain range composed of this rock that formed down below in a magma chamber. That's the scene in many places where the cones used to stand. I-90 travelers drive right through one of those old magma chambers, the Snoqualmie Batholith. Much of the bedrock west of the summit is granite that was once molten, supplying magmas to volcanoes 25 to 17 million years ago. A huge batch of magma chamber rock? That's a batholith. The beautiful granite has coarse mineral grains of feldspar, mica, hornblende, and quartz. The minerals are big, due to the slow cooling of the magma deep underground. And there are more exposed granite batholiths north of the Snoqualmie Pass area all the way to Canada. Huge magma chambers compared to the plumbing systems beneath our majestic cones today. East of the summit, rock blasting has been an annual summer tradition to straighten out some troublesome I-90 curves. Digging and blasting has been a full-time job to make room for additional lanes, straighter stretches, and safer travel through this zone that is prone to rock falls and snow avalanches. What are they blasting here? More granite of the Snoqualmie Batholith? Nope. These are older andesite lavas and dense welded tufts of the Ohanapakash Formation. Volcanic layers that are typical south of the pass clear down to Oregon. Volcanic deposits from explosive volcanoes that died long ago. These aren't magma chamber rocks. These rocks record volcanic eruptions between 33 and 27 million years ago. The deposits outlived the volcanoes that made them. Here along I-90, dangerous rock falls have been a regular occurrence. The bedding planes and fracture sets in the bedrock are tilting toward the highway. Highway engineers and geologists have been working together to improve safety along this stretch of I-90. Huge blocks of rock are being removed, and to secure the remaining bedrock, deep anchors are drilled into more stable rock behind the fractured faces. Wow, what a challenging place to work. A narrow path between Lake Ketchelis and the rock wall, thousands of vehicles each day driving right through your work site. There's a long history here, of trying to squeeze a road into this narrow path between Lake Ketchelis and the rocky ledge along the shore. And before that, water navigation across Ketchelis was required. And before that, no vehicles of any sort through here. For centuries, Native Americans used a narrow footpath to cross the Cascades at Snoqualmie Pass. Much of I-90 follows the old trail used by the Snoqualmie people and the Yakimas. The Indians told of deep snows, tens of feet deep at the pass, a product of the rain shadow effect. West of the pass, the forests were so dense that sunlight seldom touched the earth. Huge trees towered hundreds of feet above the forest floor, locking their branches together overhead and shutting out the sunlight. Early white explorers in the 1850s 
searching for a possible wagon road and maybe even a railroad, looked hard for a suitable place to cross the mountains. A decade later, wagons rumbled over the old Indian trail through the pass. On the west side, sections of the valley floors were bottomless quagmires, impossible to cross without corduroy, split wooden planks laid over the muddy bottoms. And then in the first two decades of the 20th century, a new era came to Snoqualmie Pass. The very first automobiles somehow got through on the rough primitive wagon road. The Milwaukee Railroad completed a line over the pass, and then an impressive new two-mile tunnel through the ridge opened in 1914, which cut off four miles of track and a steep climb for the trains. Reliable year-round travel over the Cascades was now a reality by rail. Thousands of people began enjoying the mountain grandeur in the summer by taking the train from Seattle and picnicking at Lake Ketchelis and the construction of the railroad quickened the interest in an improved road over the summit, especially now that the horseless carriage was now on the scene. The Sunset Highway, Washington's first passable automobile road between western and eastern Washington, was opened, but the early cars weren't exactly reliable. Inns were situated every ten miles or so. And keeping the road open in winter was a major challenge. The first year the pass was open all winter? 1932. Plans for more lanes of traffic were begun in the late 1960s, but environmental concerns resulted in changes to construction techniques. The Franklin Falls Denny Creek Viaduct used a movable scaffold system without ground support to preserve the forest and mountain landscape as much as possible. The new elevated stretch of I-90 was completed above the falls in 1981. Think of all the travelers through time that have passed below Guy Peak, a sentinel that watches over Snoqualmie Pass. It's not a volcano, it's not a lava flow, or part of a granitic batholith. It's not even igneous rock. Guy Peak is made of sandstone that predates the formation of the mountains themselves. So the Cascade Range, how long has it been around? 40 million years. But there are rocks that are older than 40 million years. Sitting on top of old bedrock, there's a thick deposit of sandstones and shales that were deposited between 55 and 40 million years ago when Washington was a flat place. There were no major mountains. These are thick sands, shales, clays, coal beds that stretched across from west to east. This is the whole state of Washington here. But when the Cascades began, magmas from below worked their way up through the middle of this picture and volcanic activity started. So we have those sedimentary rocks to the east and west of the Cascades. And occasionally, you can find little remnants of these sandstones within the Cascades. That's Guy Peak part of this sedimentary cover that predates the development of the Cascade Range. The sandstone of Guy Peak is clearly much higher than it was when Washington did not have the Cascades. There's been serious tectonic uplift here. The Juan de Fuca plate has been slowly bashing in the leading edge of the North American plate, a collision which has forced more than 2,000 feet of uplift in the last few million years. And more than old sandstones and magma chamber rocks have been revealed by the uplift. Down by North Bend, Mount Si's oceanic Metagabro bedrock requires tens of miles of movement inland and thousands of feet up. Franklin Falls, west of the summit, exists due to stubborn metamorphosed lava rock, also with an oceanic history that has since been uplifted. Denny Mountain, is a huge block of marble, another metamorphic rock hanging out high in the Cascades. So many misplaced blocks of exotic bedrock up here that have stories of their own. And the pass lies at a newly discovered boundary. Central Washington University operates a dense network of high precision instruments that have been drilled into bedrock all across the Northwest. The Pacific Northwest Geodetic Array Panga, 
closely monitors tiny movements in the crust. Together, the GPS stations have revealed a new way to look at the Snoqualmie Pass region. So all those GPS stations of the Panga network are across this map, and these are the results. There's a beautiful, graceful, clockwise rotation of the crust in the Pacific Northwest. These yellow arrows, the longer the arrow, the faster the motion. Everybody's rotating around Pendleton, Oregon for some reason, and it's like the old game of crack the whip. You come around the outside, you're moving faster than the guys in the middle. But not everybody is rotating. This northeastern part of Washington is stable. It's part of the Canadian buttress that's not playing this rotation game. So right here at Snoqualmie Pass and the Hayak station, the GPS station from Panga that's showing still a little bit of motion to the northeast, we're crunching the crust, rotating block into non-rotating block, tons of faults, tons of folds. It explains most of the topography in central Washington. Plus, the newly discovered clockwise rotation of the Northwest offers an elegant solution to an old Cascades volcanism question. Cone-shaped volcanoes in the Cascades, why do they exist? There's a subducting one to Fuca Plate and magma is rising to the surface. On a map, the cones are in a beautiful line stretching through the Pacific Northwest. That's today, but 16 million years ago, and this has been known for a long time now. The line of cones was different. And the line switches to the east of the Cascades right here at Snoqualmie Pass. Nobody could explain this pattern until recently. Until when? Until we discovered this clockwise rotation of the Pacific Northwest. We're rotating the crust over magma coming up from the subduction zone. New instruments solving old questions. Young volcanoes replacing older ones. An Indian foot trail, a wagon road, the Sunset Highway, and now Interstate 90. Amazing changes in just a few decades. Today, crops grown in eastern Washington's Columbia Basin Irrigation Project are trucked every day to Seattle's ports using Snoqualmie Pass. And the mountains to Sound Greenway first envisioned in 1990, was founded to work toward a shared vision of keeping some of these natural lands intact along the I-90 corridor through the Cascades. Well, we're up and over the pass, looking back at Snoqualmie Pass. There's the road construction site, the U-shaped valley. Remember that Yakima Valley Glacier flowing east? That's where we head next. How far east did that glacier travel? Does Ketchelis Lake have anything to do with that glacial activity? Onward to Cleelum and the coal mines, east of here. Thanks for watching.